Anime Recap Tier. Today I'm going to explain an adventure fantasy anime called Death March to the Parallel World Rhapsody. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. Being a corporate slave is nothing new for Ichiro Suzuki. He wears it like a badge of honor, equally proud and exhausted of his chosen life. On his way to work, he waits for the 8.33 a.m. scheduled train, only to find out that it's Sunday, so the train arrives earlier than he expects. He runs to catch the train that will bring him to the office. There he meets an acquaintance from work who comments on Suzuki's habit of working on weekends. However, the man finds himself having no choice because the new guy on the job left before the delivery date. Now, the overwhelming work calls for him to death march, to sacrifice more hours to finish a project before the deadline. With an optimistic look and bright eyes, he says, time to start the death march. Late that afternoon, the non-stop pressing of keyboards and quiet but stressful buzz in the office becomes the soundtrack of Suzuki's death march. His work is running smoothly until he is approached by a sleazy co-worker who gives him more work on top of his already overwhelming routine. Before promising to change the gameplay, he tells his co-worker to get the ghost signal of their bosses as it is hard to keep on making changes that will only get rejected. Three days later, Suzuki's death march continues, but his enthusiastic energy from before has depleted. The only thing left is a hollow shadow of a man with unruly hair and dark eye bags. Finally, in the afternoon, Suzuki finished his work, but he eventually discovers a bug. Now he has to work until he could debug the game, or else the players will complain. At midnight, everyone else is asleep in the office, except for him who decided to take overtime. So he decides to sleep as well after 30 hours of non-stop labor. When Suzuki's eyes open up, the depressing sight of his overworked teammates disappeared. Instead, an unknown fantasy world welcomes him. Although it seems illogical that his cell phone would work in such a place, Suzuki still checks if he can get a signal in the deserted area. However, when he sees in the reflection, surprises him. It's his younger self. He believes that he might have just fallen asleep at work and this was all a dream. In the game, his name has changed to Sato, the username he always used. However, it isn't long enough before Sato's quiet exploration of the interface is interrupted. A horde of raging creatures is coming to get him. While alarmed, he discovers that he can at least cast spells like three meteor showers and want to survey the area. This was his team's idea to help the beginners to survive the game. While using his map to look at his situation, he has to come to realize that there are around 300 enemies and it was impossible to face them in melee combat. The lizard men start targeting him using their arrows. One arrow hits the side of his face shocking Sato. The shot actually hurt. He wasn't waking up from it, and it dawns to him that this all might be real. However, his realization is a little too late as arrows rain from above. He manages to evade all of them despite the odds. The only saving grace left is the meteor shower attack, but when Sato uses the first one, nothing appears in the sky. Instead, arrows start raining from the sky. Panicked, Sato clicks on the second and third meteor shower while hoping that he doesn't die from a bug in the game. A second later, flaming meteors rain down the ground dissolving 300 lizard men. With a threat to his life gone, Sato deals with the fact that he never wished to get in this situation. Yes, all he did on Earth is to work to feel like he was doing something important, but it wasn't enough to actually want to escape to some other one. The morning after, groggy and limping from the after effects of the meteor attack, Sato wakes up to a clanking sound of metal and heavy footsteps. Unfortunately, one lucky lizard man survived the encounter because he was too far in the range of the meteor shower. The wounded captain of the lizard men throws the sword at Sato. He quickly attempts to get up. The enemy, on the other hand, takes advantage of the man's situation and attacks right away. Sato gets wounded and slumps on the floor. He was at least lucky enough to avoid the next incoming attacks. He knows there's only a smidge of life in his enemy. Thinking fast, Sato throws sand on the lizard man's face to distract him, then mightily throws his sword. Who would have thought that a programmer like him had the chops to kill a lizard man? Not me. After the brutal battle, Sato looks for a logout button to exit the game and end this dangerous dream. Much to his dismay, the exit or save button isn't working. Instead, what he finds is his status level. After killing the captain of the Lizardmen and its troops, Sato has earned level 310, effectively maximizing his stats. It's the reason he could kill the captain. I guess it's luck that saves him and not his actual combat skills. Curious, Sato tries to test the meteor shower spell he gains from leveling up. He aims the attack from far away, but he underestimates how powerful the spell is. Instantly, the meteors hit the ground and he has no choice but to run for his life. 
Without a clear path, he jumps from one place to the other and accidentally enters another world. With the dangerous ramifications of using the meteor shower spell, Sather decides to turn off his ability. Then he searches for his loot to quench his thirst. To his surprise, he finds a vintage water jug with an unlimited supply of water. But Sather gets more excited when he finds a magic wardrobe and sandals to match. Now he truly looks like he belongs in this world. Next, he upgraded every skill available to him so the next time he encounters enemies, he'll be able to fight them. Equipped with the skills and proper gear, Sata sets off to explore this world he made. The next day, he decides to go to the soldier's stronghold. Before his long journey, he admires the bright sky and clear air. It's a welcoming change from the dim life he used to have. With that in mind, Sato enjoys his travel by running through the grass fields, flying with foreign creatures, and stopping to admire the sunset. Everything seems surreal and magical all at once. He arrives the next day at the soldier's stronghold and scopes the place. The nearest city is Seiryu, one that is surrounded by 100 soldiers. However, it's the potential sighting of a wyvern that got him curious. He jumps high to look for it, only to be attacked the split second he got up in the air. As Sato stands up after he crashes to the ground, he realizes that nothing hurts even though he has scratches on his face and bodysuit. The wyvern starts to fly around Sato, like it still has some unfinished business with him. With minimal effort, he throws a tiny stone at the creature, effectively showing it away. In awe of his strength, Sato couldn't help but admire the power of being a level 310 player. However, hitting the wyvern isn't the best idea because it changes direction and heads to the soldier's stronghold. Guilty, he runs after the wyvern. He sees a battalion of soldiers ready to fight the wyvern, but their arrow couldn't even penetrate the wyvern due to its hide. Luckily, a powerful unknown creature uses an air hammer and lightning spell to get a hold of the creature. The wyvern continues to resist the attack, but a girl stops it by using an air cushion spell. The spell is so powerful that it bounces back and she in turn is hit by the impact. The girl flies far into the sky. With her spell, the other unknown lady tries to resist the girl's fall from above. Thankfully, Sato steps in and catches the girl just in time, earning him a title of a lifesaver. After catching the girl in the air, Sato lands on the ground. The girl softly steps out of his hold. Disoriented, she shares that she had been fighting a wyvern but isn't sure about it. Sato tells her that he caught her in the air after getting attacked by one. The girl thanks him with an innocent smile. When he sees this, the only thing Sato can think of is the possibility of falling in love with the girl if he was still in high school. As he introduces himself, the girl gets shy and spells out random information related to her. She starts with her name, Zena, her occupation as being part of the army, to her age and civil status. Sato keeps a smile on his face even though he is weirded out that a girl just practically gave her basic information. However, Sato's smile quickly turns to fear as a flying arrow almost hits him. It came from two of her allies, Lilio and Lona. Fortunately, Zena explains to the two about Sato. They are still skeptical about him, especially Lona who didn't believe Sato when he tells them that he's a traveling merchant. She points out that for a merchant, he's awfully empty-handed. Sato lies straight out of his face and says that the merchandise carried by his horse ran away because of the meteorites. His deception earns him the skill of persuasion and trickery. Although he doesn't like practically having the skills of the thief, he maximizes these abilities to his advantage. When Lona questions him further, his smooth lies save him from getting caught. She then questions him about his papers. As it turns out, everyone in the fantasy world has some papers they carry for identification. Of course, Sato being from a different world has no papers he can show. Good thing he has mastery of persuasion. After that, Lona decides to accept his explanation and offer to get him new papers. On the way to Salu City, Sato learns more about the working of the world. First, he learns that Zena and her friends were tasked to investigate changes from the fall of meteorites, or as they call it, Starfall. Second, he learns that Wyvern's hide is used for armor and cloaks for its toughness, but its meat is something to avoid. Lastly, Sato learns that slaves are a thing in the fantasy world, and they love Wyvern's meat. Curious, Sato searches for what more creatures reside in Salu. Mostly it's regular citizens, plus a single elf, which piques his interest. His investigation is cut off by Zena, who asks if he has a place to stay. Lona suggests a pricey inn near the entrance of the city that serves good food. With that in mind, Zena bids goodbye to Sato and promises to come back and thank him properly. He replies that it's not necessary. She insists that she must, due to her diligence and as thanks. Her insistence makes Sato think that if he's in high school, he would assume Zena has a thing for him. After saying goodbye, Lona assists Sato to have his papers reissued. He is asked to put his hands to a stone called Yamato. 
The issuer of papers asks if he's not a violator of the law. He replies, he's not. Then he is asked to say his name. He pauses for a moment. In this world, he's not Ichiro Suzuki anymore, but Sato. As he utters his name, his information prior to leveling to 310 shows. It says he's a 15-year-old level 1, adult. After that, the man hands his papers in exchange for one silver coin. The clerk asks him for tax payment for entering the city. Thankfully, Lona waived his tax for saving Zena. His visa is then handed to him. This visa is only for 10 days and needs to be extended if Sato plans to stay in the city for more than that. The man warns him that if he's caught with an expired visa, he will need to pay a fine or else he will be turned into a slave. He pockets that information and thanks the clerk for his service. In the streets, Lona points to the inn she was talking about earlier. Sato waves goodbye and thanks her for the help. As he walks along the busy road of Salu, he couldn't help but admire the city with the programmer's lens. It has a majestic appearance all around and finer details if one looks closer. He walks around in awe of the townscape until a woman interrupts him. The lady pulls him closer. Sato's arm accidentally gets nestled in between her bosom. Surprised, his mind zones in this circumstance while the girl convinces him to stay in the gate inn. Curious, he checks the girl's information. The girl's name is Martha, a 13-year-old level 2 creature. Sato couldn't believe that someone her age would be so ample. Sato sets his size on Martha's mom, Mosa. However, he wishes the innkeeper is a bit lighter so he can go for her. His thoughts are interrupted by the mother who looks for his luggage. As Sato lies again about his luggage getting lost, he arranges a 10-day stay in the inn. Hungry, he requests for food, but the kitchen is out at the time of the day, so Mosa serves him quiche instead. Martha waits for Sato to dig in and comments that it'll taste better when eaten right away. Mosa shoes her daughter, reminding her to clean up the coward merchant's room. Intrigued, Sato asks about the merchants. He learns that those merchants were branded cowards after spreading fear about the demon lord. They think that the demon lord picked a fight with the dragons during the starfall, but the same one the merchants were talking about was already killed by a hero 70 years ago. Today, the city's most concern is the wyvern attacks that plague it because dragons like to sleep more than kill other people. Sato's concern focuses on the demon lord. If it's true that he's currently stuck in gameplay, it means that the demon lord will be revived and serve as the final game's opponent. A moment later, Mosa leaves Sato alone with his food. He gets to taste his first meal in the fantasy world. Although quiche and pickled cabbage are not as fancy, it tastes better than what he imagines it would. While enjoying his food, Martha shows up behind his back. He takes this time to ask her where to find prefabricated clothes. It took her a moment to realize what this young man means is ready tailored clothes. She teases that at his young age, he uses uncommon words. Sato may look 17 in the foreign world he lives in, but his mind is as old as a middle-aged man in Japan. Martha shares all the places where he could shop, and her voice turns a bit higher when she excitedly announces that she will give him a tour of the city. In the busy markets of Salu, Sato sees a short creature with big ears. Excited, he assumes it is a demi-human, but these creatures are slaves and mostly stay in poor parts of the town. An angry market man shoes the a human who's carrying a lot of logs. The logs tumble to the ground and no one helps a crying demi-human. Another one from the side appears and consoles her friend, but no citizen is helping them. So Sato steps in and politely asks the man if he needs something else. The man says that Sato must take his slave to the western town where most slaves reside. After the man walks out, Sato asks the demi-human if she's alright. But the two demi-humans can only stare at him. A helping hand is something they're not accustomed to, so they stay quiet. Sato picks up the logs and ties them together using a twine. This gets him an earnest smile from them. They bid him goodbye and run towards a long-haired girl who acknowledges Sato's help. When Sato walks back to Martha, she couldn't help but comment on Sato's pleasant behavior towards demi-humans. When Sato asks if these people are hated, Martha explains why demi-humans have a bad reputation. They have killed farmers and hunters who are only trying to sell crops. True or not, Sato doesn't regret his decision to help. Although the fantasy world he lives in consists of killer demi-humans, scary lizardmen, and a demon lord, not once did he wish to go back to his life. Well, who wouldn't want to be a carefree 17-year-old with hero-level abilities? Sato may very well be staying there forever. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.